All right. We welcome all you that are watching with us today. We just had a great time jamming uh, today. I did. I hope y'all really enjoyed it because my heart was to please him and praise him. So uh, anyhow, I had a good time. I told Joel, I said, I think it's just me, but I mean, I'm, I'm like feeling the presence on this this morning, you know. But uh, one of the things that I, I'm going to bring to conclusion here is the last part, probably kind of last part, but everything we do doesn't just start and end. It's, con it's, it's continuous. It's a proceeding word that builds on the what we've learned in the past and unveils more for the future and then helps us see what we thought we knew in the past more clearly. And so I warned us the whole first message that I preached, I warned us, watch these little words, you know, dead words, words that we use that, and it's okay to use them because we're trying to communicate that it's something like this, you know, it feels something like this or feels something like that or sounds like or kind of define the definition. But if we're not careful, what we'll always do, listen, your flesh will always go to the quickest, easiest path. And it can be satisfied with terminology. I have, I have known many people who know, they'll learn a terminology about something. They'll, use, they'll, they'll learn a few Hebrew words. I have these friends that now, because they're so dissatisfied and unfulfilled with the truth that they thought they had, but previously, they've gone to now, they don't even realize it, but they're just, they're going to Kabbalahism. They're Kabbalists. I'm like, they, they may not even know what Kabbalah, Kabbalah is, but it's mystical Judaism. And they have all this terminology now in the gates and the 21, which I ain't going to lie to you, I've studied very, Kabbalah very intensively. And so I'm real familiar. I'm not an expert, but I'm telling you, I'm probably an expert compared to most people, even some of those that are beginners in Kabbalah and what it is. And they, I mean, we have this terminology and it just sounds so mystical and spiritual, you know, and dimensional. I mean, you know, fourth dimensional and quantum physics and universes and God, you know, instead of just believing what the Bible says. And when you don't understand the Bible, you will search for places, other places that you will try to comprehend. How do I you know that, Johnny? Been there and got the t-shirt. So what I've been teaching is really getting back, and I, I want you to listen real close. Pre, pre, pre fig leaf. Not fig leaf, pre fig leaf. Get back to Eden, pre-fall. Innocence, being naked and unafraid. And so I know it's easy, it's easy for us to jump and, and, and you know, get, have, have this conclusion. But if we listen real close, we can, you'll be able to hear and know what God is going to reveal to you through this word. Because you can get the verbiage. You can get the knowledge. You can get the form. You can get the end result that you think that we're referring to. So what I want to do is finish this and move to where, what the reality is. Because if I don't do that, I'm a, I don't want many of us to go ahead and replace in their mind and in their heart what they think maybe I'm referring to. And so I, we're talking about something that happened in the garden. What happened in the garden, in the garden, in the garden, say in the garden, in the garden, in the garden, is man lost his innocence. Where? In the garden. And to understand how we'll get innocence back is we got to understand that it's going to have to be in the garden, so to speak. The distinction that man has, and please, I'm starting off kind of where I left off of last week, and I don't have the time this morning to go back and give you a, a uh, to talk about all the stuff we talked about. Please. You're not going to get this in one sitting. 
You're not going to understand what I'm really talking about. But I think if you'll get it and listen, that these words of God and the Spirit of God will pierce down to you and it will make your path clear. Because if you don't know where you're go, not or if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. Is that brilliant or what? Genius. See, man's distinction in the garden, this man and female, male and female, were one. Y'all hear the word I'm using? One. One. And what Yahweh did is he separated gender to make how many? One. Tricked you, didn't I? You say, one, two. Yeah, I was like, he's, he's separated gender, but yet they were still to be. That, that's good. <laughs> that's not a trick. Even though there were two, the two shall become. Oh my God, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about an illustration or a natural physical principle? Something that God has ordained with a man and a woman so they can understand what? The purpose of God. Who God is. And the purpose, well, who is God? I used to think he was a trinity. And then I found out Catholics believed there were, there were uh, five gods. And most of my friends believed there were four gods. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Satan, Mary. So I found out the Bible said there's only one God, but yet there's really more than one God. If you understand what God is, what the name Yahweh really means, that God, I will be in whom I will be, and that His d desire, the mystery of God-likeness, the mystery of godliness, is for us to become God. Now, people just chew their tongue and foam at the mouth when I say something. You know, when I used to go to places and I'd walk out and I'd say, Hello, my name is Johnny Christ. It used to, oh my God, they didn't hear anything else I said. I had people come up to me, you ain't Johnny Christ, you ain't Jesus Christ. I said, I know, and neither is he. Because that ain't his name. I didn't say I was him, I said I am his brother. I am one with him. I am in him. I am his bride. We are his bride. And what does a bride and a wife, a bride and a husband do? Somebody tell me quickly. They become, it's the mystery, it's the mystery of, of Christ. It's, the, it's this mystery that God has that we become joined back to the oneness of God. Now we know that the Elohim had this same experience because they too had to experience shame. They had to experience and own their own sin when they obviously, seemingly, also had the experience that Adam had and that we're having because God does not give eternal life away for free. And it is a, not a biblical principle. It is a pagan principle, pagan principle to think that you can throw a virgin maiden to King Kong and make him okay with everybody else. See, that's what we've been taught. We've been taught with paganism that he was our substitute. He was not your substitute. He was your representative. There's a big difference. He was the last Adam who didn't sin. So, but the Elohim, they, what they say, if they eat of that tree, they will be what? Like us, knowing good and evil. Y'all see that? So when you understand the Elohim and what they were in their place, you know, I believe that they, in another part of the great year, you know, and aeons of time and under what, and I, I'm scared to say this, but I'm, who cares now? Uh, there, the, the constellation that we're under over these aeons of years, you know, approximately 23,000 years of the whole, you know, some people say it's 2150 for an a age or aeon or millennia or whatever you want to say, but... We are in this 
phase of what God's, how he's touching people. I believe, of course, that the Elohim were also had their time frame of how they had to qualify for immortality. And we know that they knew good and evil, but we know that God cannot sin or know evil. So we know that they're not God in the sense of the uncreated God. We know that they are the Elohim. And those are the ones who created man in the garden. Now, man, I don't know why I'm getting off that today. Maybe I'm avoiding trying to explain this. So man, got a dis- he's in the garden with his wife. I mean, he's in the garden. One body. One body. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And please don't do this. Don't try to, in your mind, figure that out in a way that you think, did man have both sexual organs or did he did? Don't even go there. I mean, that's going to that's mess you up to what the purpose of what that lesson and that story in the Bible is really trying to teach us. So when Adam and Eve sinned, obviously they became aware of who they were. They became aware and conscious. They became self-conscious. And then we know that God asked the big question, okay, Adam, now where are you? Not where are you. We know that God knows everything. He knew where Adam was, true. I mean, it'd be dumb for us to say, Adam was hiding. I'm hiding. And it's probably more of a psychological type of covering more than even a physical one so what happened is there became a distinction and that distinction was between man and woman male female and the the first distinction obviously excuse me was mainly a physical slash sexual distinction different now of course in the separation of gender that's something that i can really go real deep on i thought about doing it i just think it's too much for what we're talking about but i think the masquerading and the hiding uh through through gender through uh changing gender and all that it's the it's a matter of people hating who they are and not accepting who they really are. Because the process of God, every man and woman has to come to the place of accepting who they really are. Or they can never worship God in spirit and truth. It'll always be them pretending to be something else. They'll never ever feel really loved because they'll have him putting on this mask. And that's that's just a simple way of describing what's happened in the human race and how we get to the place that everybody seems to really be racing for, especially now because we live in such age of prosperity now. It's like I said earlier, you know, never has there been less crime and less poverty and less hunger and all those kind of things than now. And so when you are in great prosperity, you have time to think about too much stuff. A lot of us have to deal with a lot of internal dialogue only because we got too much time on our hands before we had this life of recreation and 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 leisure and we had to work you know out in the fields and the crops and 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 work every day to chop wood because if you didn't you'd freeze to death that night you didn't think about the kind of stuff we thought about today i wonder what we're going to have for for supper tonight well you didn't have to wonder about that because you knew what it was going to be or was it what it wasn't going to be what do you want to eat tonight? What? Do you know people get in arguments that lead into bigger arguments, arguments want to know where we're going to eat tonight? I don't care. They lied. So we got this thing happening where people are prosperous. They got all their bills paid. They got money in the bank. They got everything looking good. But guess what? They, they find out there's something there that ain't right still. And what the Bible says, and what I'm saying to us, they have not yet owned their sin. Who they are really are. They haven't had to face the shame of what being a human is. So, now watch. See, when man separated, when God separated male from female, 
I've heard for the last time men telling me that a characteristic of women is moodiness. Because I've got to tell you, there's nothing more pathetic to me, and I hope everybody listening to me today, there's nothing more pathetic to me than a man who's moody and whines like a little baby. And I'll tell you, it's my experience as a pastor, who people won't tell their problems to, men are worse than women. And they cycle every tenth of the month when the bills are due. I'm, trust me, it happens. It happens. Don't even think it don't. So don't think that all of that went to the female when God separated gender. I want to get back to one thing I want to touch on before I go get away from it. See, I, there's a lot of people who are, who are trying to mess with their gender. And a lot of people call it coming out. They're not coming out. They're going deeper in their masquerade. Y'all hear what I just said? They go further into their masquerade because of this thing. And we, it can go, we can get as deep and, and talk about all the words we go. And, and I mean, I can only go so deep about it, you know, well, psychology and all that. But I'll tell you, I know what the Bible tells the solution of the problem is. So, we get, we want to go back to innocence, the time before, listen, before separation of gender. Why? Because before separation of gender, there was no self-consciousness. There was no comparison. Look at me, I got, you got those, I got these, I mean, my, I got. We, we're different. I'm not talking about, and this is, I know it's easy to do this. Me and Joel were talking the other day and and so i i sent him this thing that uh it was a, a song so when, when i moved back to to, to uh, columbus i moved in with my my brother and my mother and uh i had a stereo back then i mean i had a stereo it had a cabinet and i put that thing in the back of that Volkswagen, and i brought it to my house and i would stack albums on it this big at nighttime, and just let them play. Because they drop, you know, the arm would say, it would drop. Sometimes we'd have to put a, a nickel on the, on the uh, needle arm. You know, y'all know what I'm talking about. It'd be doing like this, you know. But we play these songs. So I played, I sent him this song. Well, then he went, and, we went and played dirty. He went way down to a song. And, uh, and my, wife had, my wife had just played that song, for another song by them. And then Joel sent me this song by this guy who I, I didn't know him personally back then. I think I was probably 18 years old when I, I went and saw him sing in concert. His name was Pat Terry. And I mean, I, I liked Pat Terry, Pat Terry a lot and sang a lot of his music when I was younger. And, and uh, it's not the Pat Terry that probably comes up on the Internet. It's another one. But YouTube has him, right, Joel? So here, I mean, Joel sent me this song. It wrecked me. It wrecked me. I mean, I've been laying around, and the doctor said, don't do this. But, uh, you know, so I've been laying around, but still, this song wrecked me. And then Wednesday night, I found out it wrecked him. Because nostalgia has a way of doing that. Because we think that the old days are the good days. My daddy missed the old, good old days, and my daddy went through the daggum uh, depression. Poor. But the reason they're the good days is because you don't have to deal with them. They're already past. You overcame them. You don't have to worry about something you've already overcome, true? So what happens is, you know, we want to look for a time in our past of our innocence. But really, that's not the proper word. Because there is no time in your past that you were ever innocent. Y'all hear me? Why? Because you were born the old man. Now, I know people don't like to hear that. Now, we can go back to a time of sincerity where we're sincere. 
We were sincere. You don't think I was sincere during those times? You don't think Joel was sincere? Dude, we were like sellouts. We'll sell out everything. We don't care. We're going to you know, sell all we have, give it to the poor, go follow the Lord, hate everything, everybody. I mean, been there. But it wasn't innocent. You know, we were talking one Wednesday night here and was talking, discussing this. Do we really love people or is there always an ulterior motive of selfishness there somewhere? Is there an expectation of a barter or a trade back for what, the love I'm giving you? I mean, that's a, hard, that's a hard one, right? I love you, and guess what you want? You, want you, you have an expectation. I say that I think it's fair if we just go ahead and be honest. Look, I'm going to give you this, but this is what I want in trade for it. It'll save a lot of marriages, a lot of friendships, a lot of relationships. Let's just say it. But I'm not talking about going to nostalgic sincerity. Because all of us have been in a place where we were sincere. The problem is when it comes to our position with God, we were sincerely wrong. Even though we... Do you know how many sincere people flew into the Twin Towers? Now, but you know their motivation was what? Virgins. And they are as dumb as the American church is or ignorant because they don't know that those aren't female virgins, women who've never had sex in the picture in their mind. Let me tell you what they are. It's just virgin olive plants. Studied it. It's right there. It's easy for a man like me to even understand that. I hope that don't get out. See, I can't go back to my innocence because I was born into sin. And there is a unification and a false oneness that took place. Adam and Eve sinned away from the one God and being one with God and being one with one another. And guess what they traded it for? Another unity. After they were separated from God, they joined the other unity club called Unified together in sin. So they're all, we all have that in common. Let me tell you what happens. You go tonight. No, I don't go tonight. This is an illustration. You go to a bar somewhere tonight, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to see people with one heart, one mind, one vision, one hope, one dream. One, they, they, have, they are unified. It's church. They have a unification there of their, uh, because of what sin is. And they're drawn there, and they gather there, and they spend money there. Adam and Eve both have one thing in common now. What? They both sin. And they both ultimately, and this is what people will do who sinners, they're going to blame somebody else for their sin. So the question is, okay, Adam, where are you? Where is, where is the real you? Where are, who are you? Who are you going to choose to be? Who are you going to decide who you are? Because the Bible says that we have the power to choose between life and between death. So I can make the choice of who I am. Who are you? Where are you? Where's the real you, Johnny? Okay, I know the real me. It was that little toe-headed boy that was looking in that mirror. No, that was the fallen, uninnocent boy. But something was calling me to be something that I was not. But yet there was something that gave me a yearning in me to say, is this me or is that me? Okay, but what is me really? So without knowing what the real me was and the goal was of my real me, then I begin to look for my, the real me it played out in other images that I looked into. Does that make sense? I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that, or I'm going to dress like this, or I'm going to talk like that, and I'm going to have a car like that, and I'm going to have a house like that, and if I do all of that, then I'm going to feel like what I think that person's feeling like, but he ain't really, or she ain't really. We know for a fact that the material world cannot satisfy that thing in us. That's what the prodigal son went after. He had this idea that he could find himself outside of his father's house. 
You hear what I just said? You can't. He did find himself outside of his father's house. He, where did he find himself? Well, you know the story. He found himself who he really was. He was eating with the pigs. That's why everybody, man, they're going to look for their self. You're going to wind up eating with the pigs, and it's going to show you something. You're going to say something like, man, I found myself. That's why I tell people, I went looking for myself because I was lost. And when I found myself, guess where I was? Lost. That's where you're going to find yourself. You're not going to find yourself in a place of not being lost. And it's the greatest thing that will happen to you. When somebody comes to the end of their self, now they're ready to see who they really are called by God to be. Because we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Hallelujah. That's who I am, Johnny Christ. And I'm working my way to fulfilling that. But you can't do that till you, you, you have to have a sense of your identity. And when you find out, hey, I'm not that good of a guy I thought I was. Even as good as I got a God I was doing, good and evil came from the same tree. I'm a good man. You're a good man, Johnny. You're a good guy. Man. I wasn't that good, and I knew it. How many of you knew you wasn't that good? Even when you portrayed it, you knew you wasn't that good. You knew there was something in there. Ooh, man, what you do in the dark is really who you are, you know, when nobody's looking. That's who you really are. But I found this, that the prodigal son did not get his feelings of unworth because he ate with those pigs. You would think that would be the thing. You would think, well, I ate with the pigs. I have no unworth. The feelings started, uh, feelings of unworth started in his father's house when he didn't know who he really was. We have to know who God has called us to be and what we're supposed to do to become that and to get there. We're going back to Eden, but we ain't there yet. And if you noticed, I said we. It wasn't about feeding with the swine. It's about owning the awareness of this unfolding identity of who we are. And watch this term. I tell you what, I bet I was 20 years old. And I did a, when I first started studying Greek and stuff, through the Word of Faith movement, you know, Kenneth Hagin and all those guys. And, and you know, I, man, I was invited to be part of that movement. And, and I was on my way out there to get ordained and all that. And I will tell you, I got to Baghdad, Florida. And I believe God said, stop. And I'm like, whoa. And that's a long story about men that you've probably heard of and blah, blah, blah. And that's irrelevant to me. All I know is this. When I was about 20, 21, I did a study called this, In Christ. I looked up every scripture in the Bible that said we are in Christ. The problem is, a lot of times, when we, when we study books or other things, we can get distracted with a concept of something that has a smell of truth on it. I went down many roads just to find out that wasn't the right road, and I wasted a lot of time doing it. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses, verses 4 through 6, Paul called this thing, he's talking about his understanding of this thing called the mystery of Christ. And he said that this mystery wasn't known to these other generations. And what this mystery was about, listen to this, it was about involving the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, how many of you know that's a big deal? Jews separated from Gentiles. 
You're talking about being separated. You're talking about separating gender. You're talking about, I mean, we, we were separating nationalities, even though they were one. Now there's separation. And we see that all through the scriptures. And I really didn't take the time to go through all of that. But, you know, Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob. I mean, we just, spirit, and, you know, I mean, we, we can just go on and on and on and on. But here's another thing that Paul's talking about, a mystery of Christ. What's the mystery of Christ? It's bringing duality into singular, a, a, to a single thing, one thing. It's bringing things that are dualistic into one. And so here we got, here we got Paul talking about, okay, now we got who? We got the Jews and the Gentiles. And the fact of the matter is, this is not even the time for the Jews. This is the time for the Gentiles. Because they have been grafted in and be called, watch this, and God cut them off. Separated the two. Brought them in. And he did it for one reason, the Bible says, jealousy. To make them want to be part. So here's this mystery. Here's this, here's this mystery of Christ. And it's bringing in the Jews and the Gentiles and becoming what? A new man in Christ. Did y'all hear what I said? A, a new nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a kingdom people. I mean, we go on and on and on. It's just the whole message of the Bible. That's why you can't get saved. Well, there's a lot of reasons why you can't get saved listening to the American gospel because there's no such thing as getting saved the way the American gospel tells you. You don't come down the aisle, pray a sinner's prayer, and you're saved. How many of you know that's bull? Huh? How many of you know that's bull? So you know you can't get saved that way. But the reason they don't understand, because the good news is not that Jesus died on the cross for us. The good news is, is the, about the kingdom. Yeshua never even mentioned about him dying on the cross. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. I'm the king. Kingdom of God's at hand. And that's a whole other teaching, what that symbolically means to the Hebrews at hand. So here we have these sons of men who didn't know anything about it. Here, here God is saying, okay, listen, what am I doing? He's going to do the same old thing he's always done because he is one. And he's going to take those that are separate from him and bring them into him and make them one with him. God is one God. And we are be invited into becoming part of what God is. Not Yahweh, not the uncreated individual, if you want to call it that. He's a spirit. It's kind of, you know, the person of Yahweh because he's his own person, so to speak, even though he's not a person. <laughs> but part of the Yahweh family, the God family. So now, in Christ, we're doing it. So really, for me to say my name is Johnny Christ is to prove that I have an understanding of the very thing that God's doing. He's going to take me, and He's going to add me to y'all, and He's going to add us to Him, Christ, and in Christ, we will be added to God. Now, part of that adding, because I chose to be married, and I'm added there. Now, I, I said this, I tried to jump on this earlier. When I said, made this statement like this, I said, uh, you know, I want to let you all know ahead of time, what I'm still preaching is ecclesia. And if we ever need it before, we need it now. Because we got these long rangers. Though I really hate to boast, I'll be God's long ranger. On fire from coast to coast, I'll be God's solo worker. Though it's never worked before, I got a hunch this time it won't be such a fruitless chore. All oh, these one, these individual Christians who have no clue that it is impossible to be a true Christian. And you can be a Christian in the sense that Constantine, who invented Christianity, and that's what Christians were. I'm talking about biblical salvation is impossible by yourself unless you're on the Isle of Patmos. Or as I said before, or with Gilligan on the island.
Jews and Gentiles becoming one new man in Christ. It's, and I don't like this word anymore because it's kind of been, it's kind of a dead, played out. They just spit it out and jumped on. It's dirty. It's laying on the side. You know, the corporate Christ, the corporate man that will stand up. And I'm going to tell you what, prophetically and in my spirit, I knew this a long time ago because I preached about that corporate man standing up in the earth. I saw it as a seer. I saw it. But now I know it, and I know how to get us there. You know why? Because it takes time. We were talking Wednesday night, and one of the things that I asked the people was this. You know, what did Yeshua do in the wilderness? What was his temptation in the wilderness? Okay, to be king of the earth, to, to do miracles, and to, uh, what was the third one? See, what, you know, it matters, but it ain't going to matter right now. No, this is what happened. He was tempted to take a shortcut. Y'all heard what I just said? He was tempted to take a shortcut. Most people believe if they're talented enough, if they're gifted enough, and I'm going to tell you, nothing is more frustrating to me than, uh, what was the word I used? Uh, de deceived ignorance. Or something like that. What, what do you call it? People who think they're great. And they're not. But they think they are. Bold ignorance maybe is what I was saying. It always takes me back to boat right. That guy, he's, he said he could outrun me. He could faster than me. He could beat me up. I said, do it. Oh, I can do it. The kid was like. 12 years old, he already had a receding hairline. I'm like, I know. I was like, dude, I don't care. I'm going to put a knot on you. Come on, let's go. Well, he never would. But I ain't going to lie to you. I was in Sunday school class one time. And they had those heaters that had those, those inserts in it that the gas would make real hot. You know what I'm talking about? On the backside, it had those little pointy things and like porcelain or some kind of material there ceramic i think it was and we'd go to our little dad our daddy's little church and it'd be freezing and he turned those he wouldn't turn them on until after we got there so we was freezing and you could back up to one of those heaters and get so warm the problem is when you moved your blue jeans were hotter than hades we had three revivals start because of that <laughs> Oh, just because my sister Charlotte, she, her, her dress that went all the way down to her ankles backed up to that heater. And when she stepped out and that dress hit the back of her legs, she started, woo, like she started doing that. And everybody, Sister Dixon and all the other people, all, Brother Savage and all of them, well, they, revival started with like four weeks revival. It could have happened. I have no idea how that fits into my message. But it woke a few of you up. Uh, it's just the anointing. Anyhow, ignorant people who are bold kind of get on my nerves. It's like a guy who thinks he's handsome and he's hitting on all these women and stuff. It just makes me, it gets on my nerves. Like, dude. No chance in hell. No chance in hell. A little further down the food chain for you, buddy. Next time I see him, he's with this beautiful model. I ain't going to tell you what their name was. We have this place in the body of Christ who we are, the same way that there are many Christians, if you want to call it that. We all have to have this individual experience in house number one. But there's only one new man. And our identity has to be in the new man. And we have to repent and get out of the old man. And that's not always easy. Because it's so ingrained in us 
And then we've nurtured it from the time we're children looking for ourself. In order to understand this new man, I think we got to know about this old man that God created Adam who fell. Every person in Adam is not only a sinner individually, but you got put together corporately in something called the old man. Y'all hear what I just said? So I don't believe in going to church. You stupid. You are in the old man church. They just don't go to church. Some of them do. But y'all understand what I just said. When a sinner, when an old man hears the gospel of the kingdom, then what happens he gets invited into being the new man. Not only will he become an individually a new man, all things have passed away, everything become new. He, God wipes away the, all the past sin, and he make, gives you a clean slate, new creation. But the process has to make you understand and have the introduction of being baptized not only in in repentance, and not only in water, and not only in the Holy Spirit, and not only with fire, but also you have to be baptized into the body. What body? The new man, which is Christ. Yeshua Christ. And then there's baptism into suffering. And then one day, baptism into the clouds. Cloud, baptism into the cloud when all the people of all the ages of time get their well done. bam Technically, we are getting baptized into those faithful witness that we, the Bible says, we're foreseeing, we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every sin and the weight that does so easily beset us, looking unto Yahshua, the author and finisher of faith. So here we are in this place, understanding that we become part of a one. Just like the mystery of Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles are going to be one. We become one. Part of that corporate man, expressed only locally, because if it's not expressed locally, it will never have an opportunity to do what the body is supposed to do to one another. You... You have to have fellowship. My wife said it's 1030. She told me that day, she said 1030. I said, no, it's 1020. Because what I, I'm hoping for is there will be some people here who understand that if you don't give, you ain't going to get I don't know why I feel this way. I want to tell you, we tell on ourselves. When we have a lack in an area of our life, it tells on us. Because in the economy of God, in order to receive, you have to give. And I think it's okay if you want to receive for you to give. I do it purposefully. Financially, I sow seed if I want something back. I'm not so dumb that I think I can go buy a plot of land and never plow it up and never plant the seed and never water it. I don't think I'm going to get a crop. And then get mad because, oh, man, he's got corn over there. He's got turnips over there. Guess what I got? Nothing. Why? Because you didn't sow. Y'all, does that, is that simple? Is that simple? A lot of people do so. But then they burn their crop down with their unbelief and their doubts and this, you know, poor mouthing and all this kind of stuff. So we come into this place, this body of Christ is one way to put it. Chapter 1, watch this. Chapter 1 in Ephesians talks about the body. Chapter 2 talks about the new man. Chapter 3 talks about the mystery of Christ. Chapter 4 speaks about building up the body. Chapter 5 speaks of the responsibility of the ecclesia. Chapter 6 talks about our warfare. The peak, the culmination, the top of the ladder 
of, grow, of, of, of doing what God's called us to do and the work of the church and, the, and all those things I just quoted is what? The new man. He's forming a body. There's a body that he's forming. There's a people that he's forming. God is not interested. Now, I'm going to tell you this. <clears throat> Most people believe if they have enough talent, they have enough intellect, if they have enough strength, if they're gifted enough, that they're going to bear fruit. They won't. They can bear some fruit, but it won't remain. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you how to bear fruit. It's when you get planted. Period. When you get planted like a tree by the rivers of living water, you will bring forth your fruit in due season. And if you can live with that, if you can live with that, God, that is the place where God will bless you. But if you're not careful, what will happen? You'll get distracted about, oh, what about I want to what about that man? Whoa, what? Oh, well, look over there. Look how shiny that is. Look at, oh, look how, what they got. I'm telling you, what happened? You'll keep pulling up that root. You, if there even is one, you keep pulling up. You're going to go over here. I'm going to plant it over here. And you could bear a little fruit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about promised land fruit. I'm talking about grapes this big. I'm talking about fruit that endureth. Anybody interested in that but me? I want fruit in every aspect of my life, even now. But I know I can't do that because God will not make a commitment to a double-minded man. I want everybody to hear what I just said. It, was, it is profound. Yahweh will not make a commitment to a double-minded man. And I don't blame him. I'm gonna, okay, I'm going I'm to commit here with you. I, mean, I don't know if I want to or not. Well, you're off. You're out. We can believe this is where God's planted us, and you can endure that. <laughs> I said endure because you, you have to listen to me, maybe. But if you have to endure that, and, and if you stay, and those roots get deep, and you're not tempted to something, <laughs> look, some over there. That's purtier over there. That's purtier. Oh, she's nicer. Her boobs are bigger. It happens. I'll get in trouble for that later. He got more money. Those, those are the same thing. I'm tired of this. Well, if you're tired of this, you're going to get tired of everything else too. Because you're just a person that gets tired of stuff. But a man and a woman of God that can stay rooted and grounded and plugged in, I'm going to tell you what, it don't matter where you are. God will make you the head and not the tail. He will bless you. He will prosper you. While everybody else is still looking for the things, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. You're, you're sleeping with a smile on your face with peace and joy because you have settled in your heart. you part of that new man. You're committed to be who God's called you to really be. And you'll be able to find out who you really are. And it ain't nothing that you've ever had in this life. It's who God's called you to be as part of the body of Christ. And you quit getting amputated or dislocated. You, you can just get dislocated and not work. You know that? You ever had your finger dislocated? They told me, they told me, the doctor told me this about my back surgery. He said, all right now, he scared me. I am mean, still mad at him. If you don't behave yourself, do not touch a golf club for six weeks. I'm telling you, I do not want to have to do a fusion on your back. I mean, huh? What? What did he say? He scared me. Because they say, that even with the minor thing that I had, a bulging disc, you can be paralyzed. I mean, hey, wait a minute. But, and you know, and the, the way the nerve did this leg, I can understand kind of how, you know, how that could happen. And what we do in the body of Christ, man, we, you know, if, we, if we're not careful and behave ourselves and understand what we're committed to, we can get paralyzed in the body. We can get dislocated in our faith and in our relationship and understanding. 
But you know what happens? And I'm sorry, I have to do this. But the American church does not give us an opportunity to do the very things that it takes to qualify for immortality. Hey, Jesus did it all. You ain't got to do nothing. The very purpose of God calling you is not so you can go to heaven and live happy with grandma and grandpa. No disrespect. It's not so you can go fishing up there forever. That ain't no disrespect. You know, if it ain't like Dixie, I don't want to go. Don't worry. Let me tell you this. It's that you become one with God. If, if you'd rather go fishing than become one with God, you never tasted or even smelled what I'm talking about. Let me tell you a lie today. And there's people, there's people listening to me, and I'm going to tell you what. You're going to die. You're going to die where you are. Because you don't have the courage to come out. Because you love your mama, your daddy, your husband, your wife, your children, your friends, your buddies. That thing, you love them more than you love Yahweh. And I want to tell you what, you can't do that. It's called idolatry when you do that. It's okay, Johnny. It's okay. And they will let you serve God on an individual basis. The biggest problem I have is I can't comprehend that. So I assume that you're not just an individual visitor here, but you are becoming part of something that I'm part of and somewhat responsible for. So now all of a sudden, you want to, get, you want to be individual? Well, I'm going to get real individual with you. And i got to tell you, there's not a lot of people can take me being individual with them. Because we go to the top of this, back to this message, because men, men are weak, and they're moody, and a lot, not everybody, I, mean, I know a lot of men that are not, in my life, strong men, brooded and grounded, immovable, I mean, it don't matter, they ain't moving, they ain't moving, they're, they're and I don't mean moving, I'm talking about moving, it includes everything, I shall not be moved, how many times have we sing that a hundred times, Charlotte, wait for your dress to get hot, God, moodiness you talk to a man like a man and guess what you find out they ain't one and they're not mad at me they're mad at the fact that i'm right and not that i'm right it's sad because they still haven't found their true identity and when you uncover their masquerade they see themselves naked and afraid. He's looking for this corporate man, this new man that's going to accomplish his plan. He wants us to be to join together, to be joined together by love. I'm going to close with this. In Ephesians, it's just another illustration I, want to, illustration I want to give you about creating this new man out of two groups of people. It's just, it's just all God does. That's all He does. It's all about that. And according to Colossians, Colossians 3, verses 10 and 12, this new man, listen to this. Ooh, I like this. And maybe I didn't have to preface it with all the Garden of Eden stuff. And if I wasted your time doing that, I'll apologize. And then wait for you to see how dumb you are for thinking that. <laughs> this new man. Listen to this. The new man. The new man is renewed unto full knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I'm coming into the full measure of the statue of Christ. We are together. But we're, I'm coming to the full knowledge of the real me. According to the image 
That little boy looking in that mirror say, is that not me, me, not me, 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 not me. I'm going to try being this. I'll be that. I'll be this. But it's, it's funny. It's funny that I can probably help you understand this if you would look by using my own life. And I could probably use some of your lives, you know, that I've known for a long time. But we cycle, we'll cycle back to, to an image, you know. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Boop, there we are again. Because we really like that image, and we really want to be that image. And so we'll go, yeah, 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 I'll come and do this. And boom, we're back at that one again. You know, we just, it's like, it's like a wall that we just, same wall, just painting it a different color. But we want to get one more shot. If I get one more shot, because in that ego, man, that we're developing out of our journey away from our Father's house. That's what I'm saying. Prodigal went on a journey. Pretty good idea. Hey, I want what's mine. Give me what's mine. And he had to take the journey. We all have to take the journey. Why? We were born into the journey. And there he goes. I think all he was doing is looking for like Bono says, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Man, I used to sing that song and know it's real. Have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things. Christian knowledge just wasn't there. So he's told his daddy this. I want what's mine. And his daddy said, okay. Knowing he's going to have to go. And grow up and be a man and find out for himself. And there ain't nothing your daddy can do to stop you from doing it. And if he does stop you from doing it and he babies you too much and protects you too much and all that, all you're doing is prolong, pro prolonging something that they, you should have just let him go out there and get a good butt whipping a lot earlier. Don't throw nothing at me. We don't want our babies to be. I mean, you, you know. I got into a fight at school one time. My mother had to come to school. My mother started fighting the kid. Fifth grader. <laughs> I wish I was telling a lie. <laughs> I, wish that, I wish that wasn't the truth. Say, oh, my mama, we're friends. <laughs> this is what he said to his daddy. I want half of all you got. Got another brother over there. So I'm assuming that half of what you got. His daddy said, boop, there it is, go. He was able to experience something that finally made him realize that finding yourself is finding that there's nothing for you in the materialistic world. And in being a citizen of this world, or being the old man where you can really find who you really are. He knew something. He was smart. He had to go back to his father's house. And I ain't talking about John's house. You hear me? I ain't talking about my daddy's house, my physical daddy. I'm talking about the, my real father, my heavenly father, the father of all of us, who has called me his son. He's called me his child. Get my head really wrapped around it. Because what if I, if I get a revelation, man, I want to I have a teaching on it that makes people feel, feel like I'm smart, and I want to write a song or two about it. That's what I want revelation for. Give me another revelation. What's more? Got to write another song. Instead of it applying to my life and setting me free. I was sucking something out of it, still trying to be, I, I was using the revelation for my masquerade. So he takes, he takes off, he finds out, he can't, you can't do that. But let me tell you why. Because we're all so foolish and ignorant, we will only, we will cheat our own selves. Let me tell you how I know that. Because when his brother found out who was the wonderful in his father's house serving his father, we found that that was a lie too. And he got mad because he killed the fatty calf. His daddy said, we're going to have a feast. 
His daddy didn't say this. Well, he's going to have to earn his way up. Well, I know. How's he go? He's going to have to do. He's going to have to start at the bottom, and he's going to have to work out there, you know, with the sheep or with the cows. He's going to have to live in the servants' quarters. His daddy didn't say nothing like that. Somebody say, thank you, God. I've had people get mad, leave the church, and when they come back, I treated them like they never left. And I had some people in the church get mad at me. Well, I don't think they should be able to get up there and do that. I said, I know, prodigal brother. If it was your son, you'd appreciate me doing that. That's what I'm saying. And his daddy looked at him. And, and I don't know why I'm using this word today. I think I'm just anointed of something. His, both sons were so stupid. One, at least one took half. His father looked at him. He said, what? You're jealous because we're doing a, giving a feast? Dude, you could have a feast every weekend if you wanted one. You could have a feast every night if you wanted one. Listen to this. He said, because all I have is yours. Y'all hear what I just said? All I have is yours. When you're out there in the world and the old man and all that, you're not even going to get what you won't even. You don't, we don't have the intelligence or whatever, the wherewithal to realize that everything we have is our father. Once we understand that, you ain't going to want to leave home. But the reason we leave home is this, because we have to come to that place of recognizing that we are sinners. And we have to own the fact that we are estranged from God. And we have to realize that sin is corporate. Sin is a corporate man. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That makes us one. You heard what I just said? All the world is one, the old man, sinners. And then we come to this place of this new man. And guess what happened? We all become one, redeemed and forgiven, and on this journey together of restoration and reconciliation, this new creation that the second Adam slash last Adam is, is the father of, just like Adam was. And guess what? When we get back, when we get back to Eden, Paradise, however you want to say it. When the kingdom of God, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, what did I say? Marriage supper of the Lamb. When we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, when I, before I led up into this, Eve will no longer be separated from Adam. They will become one again. Who is Eve? We are. We are the bride of Christ. You understand what I'm saying? We are now betrothed to him. That's what, that's what this is all about. We're engaged. That's what the bloody sheet was all about, Joel, that you, you know, we, we talked about. That, that we, we show ourselves chaste and that we withheld ourselves from other, other men, so to speak. We, didn't, we no longer slept with the old man or part of the old man or we're the old man. Now we're part of the new man. An ecclesia. The corporate Christ expressed locally. And that's the only reason it is, is because we can't have intercourse. We can't have divine uh, supplying life to one another with people that we don't ever see. I mean, the sad part is there's people who don't live here who are part of our family in their minds and they believe it. But we're blessed to be able to be here. I hope you are blessed to be here. I hope you can get this. Because I want to tell you what, this year, this year is going to be a time of restoration and God doing something and bringing us to the place. If you will let him. He wants to bring us to that place of innocence. Even though we'll never really be innocent until we have our new bodies. But we know where innocence is found. And it's back in the garden. And it's found 
with the two shall become one. The mystery of Christ is the Gentiles and the Jews becoming one. Isn't that an odd pair? Not really. We all come from the same Adam. True. But it is an odd pair. We don't eat what y'all eat. You can't eat that. You can't eat that. I'm, I'm just happy to be on the Gentile side. I ain't going to lie to you. I'm, in, I'm thinking about maybe ribs. I have some ham hock and black eyed peas. God bless y'all. Thank you for tuning in.